Yeah. All right, I'm going to get started since it's promptly 3 o'clock now. Um, this talk, if you're in the wrong room, how not to build a multi-million dollar, multi -million dollar e commerce system. Um, first, a little bit about me. My name is Corey Watson. Uh, you might know me as GFAT from IRC or the Twitters or um, various other things. I'm the uh, Assistant Vice President of Technology at Magazines.com and also the co-founder of Cold Hard Code, which is a side project. Um, I'm going to open this by saying that uh, these are mostly opinions. These may not necessarily work for you. Uh, they've worked for me or they have yet to fail for me sometimes. So uh, they, they may change in the future. I, I withhold the right to do that. Um, but before we get started talking too much about this big multi ten million, many tens of millions of dollars of commerce system, I want to tell you a little bit about where I came from uh, in this in this job. When I started, um, the company that owns magazines.com is the same company that owns Books a Million. So they were using the same code base. A uh, local shop in Nashville, which is where we are, uh, built this big system for doing point of sale, fulfillment, and online sales for Books a Million. So books. It was completely outsourced from magazines.com. The owners said, well, you know, these guys are making this e-commerce website thing. That'll obviously work for magazines just as well as it does for books in their infinite wisdom. Uh, so they decided to just kind of shoehorn magazine sales into the system that was selling books. Uh, the system that they had was completely homebrew, which there's nothing really wrong with, uh, I guess. Um, but it made almost no use of CPAN. Now this thing dated back very, very old. Uh, it did not even use CGI.pm. Everything was hand rolled. They wrote their own template system. They wrote their own, I'm, I'm not really going to call it an ORM, but they went to the database their own way. They did use DBI, fortunately. Um, they even built their own web framework, completely from scratch. So uh, that caused a lot of pain for us. Um, the first bit was training people to even use it. Yeah. Uh, was it put together before small IDPM? No, it wasn't. No, no, no particularly good reason. And by the way, if there are questions through this, by all means, interrupt and ask. Um, as we get a little deeper into it, I may say some things and you won't know why we do it that way, so by all means ask. Um, so aside from making it very difficult to train people because they didn't leverage things that we all kind of knew, um, they also used really, really weird conventions. I don't have any particularly good examples, but uh, the, uh, the other amount of pain is that the original developers that we had were all kind of hybrid sysads. I come from sysads. Uh, from being a sysad, and the other guy that worked with me came from being a sysad. So not only did we have to deal with the rigors of writing an application, but we also had to deal with the fact that we were being sysads at the same time. I hadn't done that professionally in a few years, but the boss was like, oh, you can, you mean you can run these things? Well, that's great. Let's, you can do that, and you can make the site work. That sounds like a really good thing. Um, the schema wasn't really a very good use of a relational database. It wasn't particularly relational at all. Um, it, uh, and also, everything was just old. It ran on Slackware. Um, I think they installed from Bobby, I'm not sure. Uh, but um, it's just this really, really old system. And there's a lot of technical debt built up. Because if you spend all these years using all these old things, then you can't upgrade anything anymore. Because upgrading any one thing is going to break everything else. So we, we had this mountain of technical debt behind us. So that was just a small sample of my pain. Um, so a slight digression on technical debt. This is something that you should really avoid, if at all possible. Uh, I don't recommend you try to upgrade everything as soon as it comes out, but by all means, try and keep up with what's at least current in the last year or two, because otherwise, you're going to get way behind. You're going to end up with dependencies that aren't even on CPAN anymore. You have to go to the back pan for. You end up taking ownership of a few modules. I've had to do that because we've taken on things and not been able to take the time to get rid of them. Um, depending on older frameworks that sometimes are no longer maintained or that don't have the cool hip stuff in them anymore, and uh, just old practices, using you know uh, RCS or something instead of actually using something like that. So they didn't. Not that they used version control when I got this. <laughs> <laughs> so before I get into all the stuff about making a multi-million dollar website, let me first say that uh, everything you know about it is probably wrong. As developers, we have a lot of things we care about that most people in the world don't really give a shit about. Nobody, for example, gives a shit about line indexes. Nobody cares about tabs versus spaces. These are the types of things we sit at night and we're like, you know, when I'm the fucking boss, nobody's going to use tabs anymore. Well, nobody gives a shit about that in the real world. <laughs> nobody cares about what editor you use, whether you're using VI or whether you're using Emacs or TextMate or what have you. Uh, nobody cares about the operating system unless you have to pay for it. They care about that. 
uh, and speaking of that, most people don't really give a damn about licenses. And, and again, I'm talking from the perspective of working with people who aren't programmers, who aren't technical programmers. Nobody gives a shit about any of this stuff <laughs> except money. That's all that matters. I like unicorns. That's all I go by. I, I, I actually struggled to come up with enough stuff to put in there. I don't give a shit about most of it anymore either. Um, the ground rules for this conversation are availability of the site and conversion on the site are the only thing that matters to the people that pay. Yeah. What, is, what do you mean by conversion? I mean by uh, if 100 million people come to the site, what percentage of those people are actually going to give you money? Okay. So people that are converted into a sale. Um, all that all that matters to my superiors are availability and conversion. Everything else is something I have to insulate them from. It's my job to protect my peers uh, and also my superiors from the rigors of all of this stuff. Uh, they protect me in turn from finances, labor law, business deals, sales, and marketing. Not really, but they protect me enough that by and large I get to you know blissfully ignore most of those things. Except when you have to fire or hire or anything like that, because then you have to stop and do paperwork and stuff. It's usually worth it. So the scope of this conversation again, 24-7, 365 e-commerce, on all the time, 24 hours a day. We don't get to turn it off in the middle of the night. We don't get to turn the lights off and lock the doors and turn off the open sign. Um, we are extremely busy in Q4. For some weird reason, people are terrible about giving gifts and love to give magazines as gifts at the end of the year. If I'm insulting any of you, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a pretty lame gift. Yeah, that was probably good. Uh, actually, don't buy a lot of magazines. Keep doing play. Um, we're very slow in Q2 and Q3. It's kind of the doldrums for us. We can get away with a lot of stuff in Q2 and Q3. A uh, busy day for us. Now, th this is, I don't really concern myself with the larger scale of marketing and saying, you know, how many hits we really get. This is what I measure. Uh, we have a CDM that takes a lot of this stuff away from us. We offload this to other places. But my numbers I care about on a given very busy day in Q4. A little over 8 million hits, 212,000 paid views, uh, and we do 10,000 plus orders. You expect this number to kind of go up about 20%-ish every year. Um, but, uh, that's per day. Um, I probably did not get permission for that, by the way, so don't go tweetering it. <laughs> um, yeah, shit. Uh, so in the beginning, um, this is the stuff I went through. Was Pearl really the best idea? We actually did evaluate uh, the Java and Ruby stuff at the time and took a look at it and said, is this really better? Um, the old system was already Perl, so that was kind of a big bonus because I didn't have to tell my boss, hey, we're going to just change all this shit. Uh, CPAN is pretty huge, too, because there's so much stuff out there. Um, the obvious question of would I choose Perl again, I'm going to say maybe. Um, I'd probably get booed out if I said no, um, but uh, it, it's probably against it a little bit uh, for reasons I'll go into a little bit later. One of the first reasons is talent. Um, my superiors think that Perl is a bad language because it's so hard to hire people. I counter with hiring good developers is hard, period. doesn't matter what programming language you are. Uh, hiring good Perl developers is hard. There's not a big Perl market where I live in Nashville. Hiring good modern Perl developers is really hard because most people that we bring in and we're like, so yeah, you're a Perl programmer, right? He's like, yeah, I wrote some awesome Apache log parsing scripts on my last job. <laughs> That's pretty much what we get. It really is. Uh, hiring good modern Perl developers in Tennessee is really hard. One of the reasons for that, we cannot hire remote because we have to pay sales tax. And if we have Nexus in other states, we have to pay sales tax in that state at the end of the year. So if you live in uh, you know, Connecticut or something and I hire you, then I now have to pay sales tax in Connecticut on every conversion that happened in Connecticut. So unless you live in a state where nobody else lives uh, or has a really, really small population, um, or we lie. Well, I don't know. I don't know how many people are in Alaska. Delaware for the win. There you go. Yeah. So if you want to move to a crappy state and get a job at a cool Pearl shop, then I can help you out. Um, so now is where we start getting into some of my opinions. Um, hiring is a lot like designing. Um, it takes a long time if you do it right, but it's time very, very well spent. Um, don't hire people just because you need a warm body. Sometimes you get that person in and they're the only candidate you've got and you know, they can almost sort of walk around without tripping over themselves, but damn, I really need to feel it. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. And trust your gut. Don't just fire people outright, but if you've got that kind of nagging feeling, bring them back in again. Have them sit a day with you. Have them work, you know, pair with someone or something like that. Really explore that gut feeling because a lot of times it's right. Uh, the best thing you can do is hire people that are better, smarter, and preferably different than you. Uh, the reason that's really important is there's a lot of shit I just don't like to do. Um, but if you take some of the other guys that work for me and with me and stuff like that, they like to do things different. So sometimes I'll look at a problem and I'll just say, you know, I really, really, really don't want to do this. But somebody else will say, hey, that looks interesting. Or 
at least they don't hate it as bad as I do, and so they're willing to do it. So you can spread that out a lot better. Um, delegation is hard enough without that. Um, so on, on talent, something that's worked very well for us is run things like an open source project. Um, kind of have a meritocracy, get all that source code out there, try not to have too many sidebars, um, but give people code ownership at the same time, makes them feel good. Um, also, give people a very clear understanding of your expectations. I try really hard to do this. I try not to get irritated at people if I've not made it clear exactly what I expected from them. Uh, our, our company has a thing that we call a scorecard. It's kind of like a job description, except without all the bullshit. You know, plays well with others, able to communicate, self-motivated, all that stuff. Nobody, everybody just puts that as boilerplate. Actually put the things that you expect of the person. Like within three months, we expect you to know your way around Moose very, very well. Or within six months, we expect you to have, you know, joined the community, gotten into some channels and, you know, impressed some people or whatever. I, you know, just put it down on paper and make it clear because it's good for two reasons. It's good because after three to six months, you can look at that person and say, are you doing what I asked? And also, they know what they're getting into. And that's one of the hardest things about going to a new position is, what am I going to be doing there? It's very hard to get a fee. Um, expect smart people to argue is a pretty big one. When you've got a lot of smart people in a room, I mean, you're going to disagree a lot, and it's sometimes going to get kind of nasty. But that's okay, because at the end of it, we're all better for it. Uh, so expect it. Um, I highly recommend that you docu uh, document and identify failure early. When things start to go awry, just face it. That's the best thing to do. Read the Mythical Man Month. Let them tell you about telling people about failure quickly. Be reasonable. Um, and always avoid cowboy coding. Yeah. Could you expand on what kind of failure you're talking about? I'm going to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cowboy coding, of course, everybody knows what that is, but that one lone guy that, you know, you're in the middle of, let me give you an example. Uh, you're in the middle of the biggest conversion in the company's history of going from the old website to the new website. You've got this old crappy CGI system, this new shiny modern Perl system, and you've got to convert every user over from the old records to the new records. Well, the guy who's responsible for it has, and this is the night of, you know, it's like 11 o'clock at night. The guy who's responsible for this, which we're doing at 2 in the morning, his door is shut. Everybody else is up running around playing Wii, eating popcorn, dancing, you know, doing things. But this one guy is locked in his office. He's like, yeah. Why is it only one person? Cowboy So he was supposed to say, hey, you know, guys, I need a little help here. But he's kind of put himself in his office. And you're walking around, you're like, so where did, where did that guy, I almost said his name. Where's that? You know, nobody knows him, but where's he's in the room. room. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> where did that guy go? Where, where's and you know you, you go and, and and you're having this all hands meeting at about twelve. It's coming up at two. Everybody's supposed to have said what's going on, and you say, so the user conversion, uh, uh, Fred, how how how's that how's that going? He says, well, I think it's going to take about six hours. It's like, well, that's not going to be right. That's uh, we've only got two. What the. But I'm not going to say what I said at the time. I almost <laughs> fired him. Uh, but luckily, my boss was in the room and got a hand in front of me, and, and we ended up getting it squared away. But uh, that's the kind of failure that should be told early. Um, you know, spread that around, uh, especially when you work with a lot of smart people, because they're going to approach this problem some other way and probably find a better way to help you, if nothing else. So uh, it's okay to share that you sometimes don't know what the fuck you're doing. Um, <laughs> So it's important to have quality tools. Uh, all of the things related to computers are fairly cheap now. We live in a very cool age where you can buy all this amazing stuff for cheap. I highly recommend at least dual big ass monitors. This is if you're sitting, if you're if you're at home and you have to buy your own shit, then you know you probably already do this. But if you're in an office, then then get this stuff. Um, whiteboards are good. I've often found that very little real work goes on on whiteboards. Um, in fact, a lot of HR violating work sometimes goes on on whiteboards. But if nothing else, it's something that people do while they're talking to one another, and you know, it gives you an opportunity to sketch things out, but it also just lets you go around and draw stuff on each other's boards and stuff. Do your best with cubes and offices. At one point, I had every developer that worked for me in an office. It was awesome. But now they're all filed away in little cubes, and I, and I do the best I can. I try to keep it quiet um, and make it so that they're not distracted too bad, but just try to lay down the law up front with your boss if you have the ability and uh, let them know where, where you stand. I prefer Macs personally because uh, I am sick and tired of people going, well, I was going to get some work done today, but, you know, I upgraded X, and then the GLRX drivers blew up on my early gig, and now my display doesn't work anymore, and I just can't get anything done. I don't have time for that shit. So, do what? What? Yeah, what, I don't know. I don't even want to hear about it. I'm tired of that shit. I stopped, I'm too old for that shit. I don't want to mess with it anymore. I just use Macs because they work. Um, I SSH into things that work. 
So I highly recommend you use modern stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be Catalyst. These are what worked for us. Um, we used DBIX class. We actually started with class DBI. That was a bad mistake. Uh, DBIX class, honestly, I mean, I like what it does, but honestly, but I don't know if there's anybody in here who works on it. I'm sorry ahead of time, but the last year or two of releases have been kind of rocky, and it seems like every couple of releases has some major bug in it, and we can't find one we can upgrade to that doesn't put, you know, has a change log in it that says got rid of joins that are, you know, unnecessary subselects that murder people or something like that. We have a hard time with that. So, you know, whatever. Moose came along much later. Um, we've adopted very heavily. Um, and then plugins, plugins, plugins. Everything out there you can find someone else has written it. Uh, we'll get into a little more of that in a moment. Um, some other nice techniques. Um, I highly recommend that you build proof of concepts early um, to prove this stuff. For example, we're working right now on a Moose and MooseX storage based, uh, I'm not going to call it a content management system, it's actually called a product content management system. Your marketers and people that want to mess with the website need the ability to manipulate products on the fly. Uh, if you look at any uh, high end um, e commerce packages, they often have something called a product content management system. Uh, we're building one of those right now using Mongo, MooseX Storage, and Moose, and Catalyst. And uh, so we're building a proof of concept just to demonstrate that this works so we can show it to the marketing team. Get them into it early. Uh, they're terrified we're going to make something they don't know how to use. So uh, we build them proof of concept. Uh, so you're debate with code. If, uh, you know, Johnny thinks that it'd be awesome to use the super inverse, you know, holodeck function and somebody else thinks it's really great to use the mega trinary search inverse tree function, then have them settle it with code. I mean, it doesn't take that long. Uh, and if they're not willing to do that, then they're just making stupid arguments and shut up anyway. Um, when in doubt, if you're not sure how to get a problem solved, I highly recommend you write like a wiki page and document the criteria for what you're trying to do, uh, the different options that you have, and uh, that way you can share it. Yeah. That's GFAT's first law, by the way. That the moment you share with other people that you don't know what you're doing, you'll inexplicably realize you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just say it. It's amazing how dumb you sound when you talk out loud. As I'm demonstrating for everyone else. Uh, so when in doubt, write, write a wiki page and document. I'll give you a good example of that. We were looking into doing a lot of message queuing, and we weren't sure which of the various message queuing doodads out there, pieces of middleware, we should use. Well, the guys from Second Life actually had a similar thing and wrote this really long wiki, wiki page on here are all the different queuing engines, here are our criteria, here's the different things that, you know, the ways we evaluated them and where it went. And that saved us a ton of time because we were able to just look at it and say, oh, well, these guys did a lot of the work. We read the document. We didn't have to do that research. Well, other than reading their reason. Um, I highly recommend you stay just behind the curve. Uh, when somebody comes in and says, hey, we're going to, you know the, uh, the thing that says I'm writing distributed MapReduce programs in Erlang, the, you know, did you just tell me to go fuck myself thing? Yeah. Stay a little behind because that stuff will bite you in the ass. Um, but not too far behind because, again, you've got that technical debt thing. And plus, you know, these are our resumes and our careers we're talking about. So the more you can kind of stay on top of things, the more likely you can go somewhere else and show off how you know all this awesome stuff. Uh, proven is always greater than unproven. I don't think I have to really lay that out, but it needs to be said because uh, as the person deciding how to do all this, you really need to make sure that that's up front, that uh, making shit up is always worse than knowing things. Um, it's very easy to develop code in an echo chamber to just sit around and thinking, man, I, I'm going to write this super awesome web framework. It's going to be better than everything else out there and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to share it with anybody because I'm too smart to share it. That's not true. It never works. Um, the community is always going to be better than what you put together, more than likely. Um, somebody's tweeting me. Somebody's doing it to me on Twitter. Um, so uh, let's see here. Yeah, use the community. And also, I want to say up front, if you're going to go community, if you're going to say, hey, I'm going to take this, I'm going to open source it, or I'm going to contribute this, and I'm going to work with somebody else, expect it to take probably twice as long as doing it yourself. It will be twice as good when you're done, but it's probably going to take twice the time. Because uh, working with people always takes longer than doing it by yourself. But you usually get a better result. And then now Devin's tweeted to me and broken my iPhone. <laughs> there we go. Thanks for that. I, I hit I hit the open button instead of the go away and leave me alone. And I heard that. Whoever that was. But at least my phone didn't crash. Now I have to recompile my fucking phone. <laughs> 
So I highly recommend that you get on the IRC, get on the mailing list, attend the conferences, uh, which I don't have to tell you because you're already here. Uh, but don't just attend the one local to you, attend all of them. We're, we're lucky that Pearl's conferences are extremely inexpensive, and it's very easy to do, so I highly recommend you travel around. You'll only see some people at certain conferences. You go to the Northeast, you'll see some people. You go out West, you'll see others. You go down South, you'll see some um, And uh, if you've got a problem, if something doesn't work, turn your problem into a patch. People are very receptive for patches. They always say, patch is welcome. What's that? Generally. Um, if they're not, then you know GitHub is awesome. You can fork it. Um, foster an OSS culture in your environment. Make sure that people understand it. Do it with your superiors. Mine don't really know what we do. Um, they don't really know that we're open sourcing everything, but they know that we do, and they know that we benefit a lot from it, and they take some pride in it, even if it's misplaced. Um, <laughs> ask opinions. The people around us, I mean, the people that are in this room, I know some of you personally pretty well, and I don't know others of you, but I'm sure that if we pooled our collective knowledge, we would be able to build some really cool shit, because everybody in here has got something that they know better than the rest of us. Um, and remind the people that work for you often that this is your career we're talking about. Uh, you know, getting smarter and, and getting yourself out into the community can get you jobs, can get you noticed, can get you paid more, can, you know, make you famous, even, maybe. My wife told me once that even if I became famous for what I did, no one would ever know that. I love you. Process. Process pretty much universally reviled. No one wants process. No one wants procedure. No one wants red tape. Um, none is not... Agile. That's not the same thing. Agile is actually, depending on who you ask or what book you read, fairly well defined. Um, saying that I can just, uh, we just do whatever, we wing it, that's not process. That's anarchy. I'm going to say that again later. Uh, that sucks. It will get you later, especially if you get bigger. You are not the best at deciding how things should be done. There are a lot of really, really great books. Um, there's, uh, I can't think of any really great ones. The Mythical Man Month is always the go-to one. Yeah, I kind of feel trite quoting it sometimes, but I do fairly often. Um, you likely have a lot to learn about process. So pieces of software that already exist or um, you know, people who have thought a lot about this probably know more about it than you do. It doesn't mean you have to follow them to the T, but you can at least use it as a building block for the things you're going to be doing. Um, so on process, go out and find the books. Um, I've, I read one that was had some small tidbits called uh, Agile Lifecycle Management by uh, Manning Press. Pretty decent. Um, it's mainly Java related, but you can kind of pluck some of the good features out. Ask other people what they do. Um, I believe it was either at the last year or the one before uh, Ricardo and I sat and spoke for a little while about the way our different teams manage these things. And it was nice to hear someone else's. Um, or, or, you know, bring what you've done at other companies as well. Uh, and, and share it with others. You know, if you've got a company blog or something, write that and share with people how you work. Uh, and add it iteratively. That's the biggest thing I, I've learned, is um, something I call the puppy method. Developers are like puppies because they shit on the floor. Um, <laughs> add process when something breaks. So when that happens, when they pee on the floor, when they do the bad thing, and this is including yourself. I mean, you know, even if you're a working manager like me and you do write your own code, we screw up too. Uh, I just don't tell anybody about it. Just rewrite the git. git. Um, you know, when it happens, that's when you strike. Because that's when they still feel guilty. If you give them a day to think about it and go home, all that hubris comes back. And so they think they're super smart again. Uh, but when it happens, that's when you rub your nose in. That's when you immediately call everybody together and say, look how stupid you are. I'm going to put this in place so that we don't do it again and so that I can make up for you being stupid. Don't really talk to them that way. They don't like it. But that's what you can think. <laughs> um, no, it, it, it really does help that when you screw it up, that's when you talk about it. That's when you get together and you say, okay, you know, we just put a patch in production and there were three different tickets that didn't get done. We didn't have the configuration. We didn't install the new module. And the cycle's down for five minutes. You don't have to pick anybody out and blame them. Look at the guys that work for me. Um, but uh, I'm just kidding. I don't think they broke anything recently. Uh, but that's but that's when you know there's a problem. And you can say, okay, we just you know frazzled the WAS job, so let's put something in place to make sure that we don't frazzle it next time, or at least a check. I mean, write it on the board, like put a sticky note on your monitor that said, "Have you frazzled the WAS job?" It's important. But remember, it's your fault because you didn't think of it ahead of time, and we always have to take responsibility as managers for doing this stuff uh, because it's always our fault because we're the ones who get fired when it breaks. So on technical tidbits, um, I, I, again, if you have questions about any of the stuff I bring up here, by all means ask them because I have screwed up a lot of stuff. Um, it's hard for me to quantify or qualify them all, and I'm better not doing it because I don't want to point out to anyone 
how poorly I've done in case I work for or with one of you in the future. Um, many of them are very situational or probably not relevant or have worked with you. Um, solutions are not universal, but I will try to address them in the best way possible. Um, this is the, 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 it should really be the software, this should be the first line in the software Bible, the Ten Commandments of Software. Thou shalt make things as simple as possible. Um, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. But simple is always better. I know that that thing that you wrote that's 500 lines of code and has no documentation, it solves this problem really, really well. But a week from now, when you're no longer drunk, or you're no longer on highly refined opiates, or you're no longer on like the 36th of your 36-hour coding binge, you are not going to remember what the hell that thing was. You're never going to be able to read it again. I can see it in a lot of your C panels. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of mine, too. Some of my best code I've written while on uh, drugs. But, uh, <laughs> not really. I wrote one, one good thing. I, I stubbed my toe really bad one time. Oh, I broke it and then uh, took a, uh, the stuff that they give you when you're wisdom teeth. Are, wrote some badass search code. Uh, I have no idea how it works, but I, I, can't, I can't replace it. It's still there. Um, but, uh, but always try to keep that in mind. And as a manager, always look for the simplest way to solve a problem and coach the people that are working for you and yourself uh, and, and listen to them when they tell you. The simple way is often the best way. If, if it's not the best way, it's the easiest to put back together when it breaks. Um, consistency is good. Uh, we are extremely consistent in table names. Um, at magazines.com, there's an orders table. Makes sense. The things that you buy at magazines.com, it's industry terminology. It's called an authorization. We're authorized to sell a product at a certain price under certain conditions. So we don't have a line items table. We have an authorizations table that's linked via a table called order underscore authorizations. Now, you get some nasty ones like shipment underscore batch underscore fulfillment underscore order underscore authorizations and some other nasty stuff like that. But as long as your RDBMS doesn't bitch at you, there's no real penalty for long names. That's what aliasing is for in SQL. Um, directories and package structures and all this other stuff, even if it's not great, once you've had convention, stick with it because it makes it much easier for the people that you bring in to figure out what the hell you were doing when you've asked them to do something nigh on impossible. Um, Hardware, and this is more on the production side. When I started, I was I came from smaller companies, so I didn't want to spend a lot of money, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, I wanted them to give me the money instead of spending the money on the hardware. Turns out that doesn't work that way. They just don't give you any more money, you know? I, mean, like, I could buy $30,000 worth of servers, but I only bought 10, so you should give me a $20,000 raise. They can't amortize me that way. So it turns out it doesn't work. And you're more expensive anyway. Yeah. Um, so, memory and hard drives are cheap, so buy as many as you can get. Um, the, the cloud is cheap, so you know, spend as much on that as you can spend, what have you. Um, but a few grand in hardware spend can make a huge, huge difference. And most companies amortize that over a long period of time anyway, so they're way more likely to spend five extra grand so that you can fit your entire data set into memory. That's what we did. Database is somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 gigabytes, so we bought something that's got like 50 gigabytes of RAM in it, and that way you don't have to worry about it. So you can cover up your own failings by just buying a lot of RAM. <laughs> um, this is something I, those of you who know the stuff I work on, I'm big on data visualization. It's something I really enjoy, graphs and charts and shit. Um, I highly recommend you use something like Munin if you've never heard of it. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a tool that you can install on all your servers and then feed all your metrics back, like memory usage, and CPU utilization, and da 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 But what's important about this is when someone comes to you and says, all right, Corey, this has happened to me, we are going to add 50,000 products to the website. What's going to break? Well, I don't really know. They don't know that, but I don't really know what's going to break. But I can guess by saying, all right, well, currently we have this many, and our search server does, has this kind of utilization, so if we you know, triple the number of requests and put five times the data in it, this is what's going to roughly happen. None of that stuff's really as linear as we'd like it to be, but at least you know better than just kind of going, uh, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break. Um, at least you can pretend to know what you're talking about, which oddly goes a long way as a technical person. Um, it's, it's sounding like you know. Uh, everything fails. Every single thing you make or use or plug in especially is going to fail at some post. But the magic smoke will come out, what have you. Uh, on a holiday. Thank you. This is very apropos now. So, 
uh, uh, Black Friday. This is just a few months ago. We are we're all we got all our shit stood up. We got extra web servers stood up, so we're going to be doing so much traffic. And you know, we we dotted every I and crossed every T, and everything's great. And then some asshole at the colo decides to do electrical work and kicks the plug out of the wall oh, on one of our PPUs. <laughs> And the whole site goes down. And we're scratching our heads because, I mean, you know, we think we know what we're doing. And, you know, this is not supposed to happen. Well, what had happened, one of the switches was unplugged and went, went out. And then the dual load balancers, hardware load balancers that we had, one of them, the one that was taking over was on that switch, while the one that went down because it was plugged into that PDU was on the other switch. So the load balancer was up, and the web servers were up, but the switch was down, so it couldn't communicate with any of them, so it failed all the web servers and sat there scratching its ass. That's what happens. Uh, so you need to do that thought exercise. I believe it's Netflix is famous for actually going around and just unplugging and turning shit off just to see what happens. It's a very good practice. Expensive, but yeah. It's just the name of the process that they... Used for that is great. It's called the chaos motion. Yeah, I, I've heard that. I just recently read it, so I didn't have time to add it. But it, it's really great. I mean, you go around and, and just try it. I mean, hire someone to do that. It's an awesome job. I, if you want someone, I will consult. <laughs> I'm just going to go around and kick shit out. Of it. Uh, database normalization. I am a normal son of a bitch. Uh, I will normalize norm databases. I will normalize the shit out of your database. And it's really, really, really great because there's all this referential integrity and there's a data duplication and, you know, the, the books would be proud. But that's not really so good when it takes 11 table joins to get reasonable data. Now, we often think transactionally on my side of the house how to minimize joins and all this other stuff for me. That we do pretty well. But where it really comes into play is when you've got to set up a data warehouse or do reporting on this data. You have really gotten yourself into a bad spot because the data is so normal and especially when you need to go backwards. So if you ever need to go backward and you say, okay, well, I know I've got a renewal and I know that this renewal is ready to be done today. We wrote our renewals. So by the way, those of you who don't know, we auto-renew you. So if you buy a year's worth of People magazine, then a year from now we're going to renew you again. And that's a huge, huge part of our business. We do a ton of business that way. In fact, it exceeds new business, I think, two years ago. Um, so... That's really great. I, we wrote it so that it was very quick to discern what needs to be renewed today, because that's what matters to me. But if you asked what, uh, what renewed today and why, crickets. I got nothing for it. Because it's so hard to go backward, and oftentimes we just don't put the right links in the right places. So it's very important that you talk to your business owners before, talk about the reports that are going to happen. Uh, and actually, um, something I've learned a lot is that you really, really should be thinking about reporting while you're building your schema. Um, wasn't so good at that. Uh, on that, when you're talking about data warehouses, always put a date updated column in every damn table. Doesn't matter if you think you're going to need it or not. Always put it there. There are 130 tables in my database, and like five of them maybe have a date updated column. So now I'm going to have to go back and do all that. Oh, think about normalization of both directions. There we go. Uh, something I learned from our finance supportments or finance people: debits always need credits. Everything has to balance. Uh, you can't just go and put in, you know, minus five dollars because that five dollars goes somewhere else, and they're going to expect you to do the little T thing where you put the, the debits and the credits and you put it on either side. And I always get the debit and the credit backwards. I can never remember. I just know that I just I want them to credit my bank account. That's what I'm worried about. Um, audit, 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 audit. Every time somebody changes something, at least log it. Who it was, when they did it, what they did. Um, all that's important because at some point someone will just load up your admin thing and just get right in a form and publish it to the site and take the whole thing down and it's your fault if you can't say that you know Freddie from marketing was the one that did it then it's your problem and it still is your problem when they paste in especially when they paste in uh, stuff from word documents with the smart quotes and mixed encoding and everything what's that in the bad HTML in the bad pseudo markup yeah all that yeah all that stuff when they don't close a tag or they leave something open or they paste in javascript that you know does while one or something like that uh, that's very important. Be very careful with non-binary flags. Originally, our order table had a status column, which was like a, just a single chart, and it could be in N status or C status or whatever status, and you end up writing this huge method to go back and double check whether or not it's in the appropriate status, and you get this big mess. What we switched to were a series of binary flags that could be flipped on and off so that you could see different states and when they happen. In our newer applications, we're actually using date columns as binary flags so that you both know when it changed and that it changed, which is kind of cool. 
but I don't know that I'd recommend it anymore. So you need to change it. Suck it up. Um, learn better ways to do it. It's a bad fact of uh, relational databases that a lot of times that sucks. Um, a good trick is to use temporary tables. So make a temporary table like uh, you know orders underscore new. Make it your new style and then write something to copy it over. Yeah. So we give the temporary table a date and a description so you know what the fuck it is later. That helps too. Um, don't just call it Corey's fuck up because <laughs> um, you don't know if you get rid of it or not because he's always doing that. <laughs> um, but if but, you dated that, yeah. Well, yeah, we, this is oh, that day. I don't remember that, that one. one. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's um, um, so yeah. That, there's there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Be kind of creative about them, but suck it up and do it now. Because if you're like, oh, that's going to take a five minute outage. Well, you you pile enough of those up, and your data gets messy, and then suddenly now you need three hour outages in the middle of the night to be able to do it. Um, document databases. This is something that we started to use. Um, they're really, really great. And it's like, how oh, I don't need schemas. I can just cram any old unstructured crap in there, hashes and everything. And uh, that's really great. Um, I don't know how many of you guys follow Mongo, but everybody got Mongo. was like, wow, this is so much like a relational database, except with all the problems. And I'll just put that into it. It'll be great. And then they didn't know that, well, it tells you that you're commit committed, but it didn't actually commit. It may not have gone in yet. Um, there's some other ones, too, that are, there's some other problems that doesn't have a transaction law. There's all kinds of problems with MongoDB. If you know them and you know what you're getting into, that's okay. But you've got to be educated and know what those are. So they're a bit unproven, uh, but they're also really good for data that changes a lot. Our product content uh, management system uses them because they just need to be able to create arbitrary fields and stick them on these things. But it's also a system that we cache the hell out of and can make 18 copies of, so it's okay. We can get by but we wouldn't do it with our carts and, and that type of transactional data because you need that uh, relational database stuff that you know we're all trying to get away from. Acid. Um, they're really exclusive. Acid. Acid, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, you can't just, you know, because if you get rid of the C, then you get AIDS and nobody wants that. And there's all kinds of other problems. You get MySQL. Yeah, you get MySQL. <laughs> well, MySQL is okay too if you, if you tickle it right. But again, that's one of those things you got to know what you're getting into because you just truncate shit and not tell you. Um, yeah, well, they, they've all got their problems. Um, the, uh, they're also very good in hybrid situations. Saying that you're going to use MySQL doesn't mean you can't use anything else. Saying you're going to use Mongo doesn't mean you can't have used MySQL for some of the other stuff that you're doing. Uh, in a project that uh, see, Cold Hard Code is working on right now, we're using MySQL for all the user and organization data, but then on some of the higher level data, we're using Mongo and then pairing them up. Uh, we're using the strengths from both sides, so that way we've got the consistency that we need, but we've also got some of the flexibility and speed that we get out of Mongo. Um, do research, benchmark, and test it. I, I mean, that gets, you know, everybody says that, but very rarely do you actually do it. Um, it really helps to have people that can help you with that. And we use MongoDB. We're using it in production. We have been for a while. Works very well. Um, but we only put certain stuff in it. We would never put transactional stuff in it for now. Uh, although there is, uh, I hear they're going to turn on a transaction log. It won't be the default, but in... One seven or one eight, the next version they're shipping, they'll have that. So that'll hopefully be pretty good. This is one that I, I was is all my fault. Um, originally, uh, for those of you who are familiar with DBX class, you already know what a row object is. If you're not, the row represents the, the line in the in the table, the the col or the, the the columns and everything. Um, we originally said, oh, well, we've got a, a cart row object, so we'll just hang every method in the world off of that. And before you know it, you've got like 17,000 methods all crammed into your row object. And then every one of your developers are going in, adding methods and changing methods, and moving them around. Not a good idea. What we've ended up doing and had much better success with is creating a model that uses those row objects. But, you know, it, it customizes that particular, the, the greatest example I can think of is originally everything to do with placing an order was in our cart row object. And every time we needed to make a tiny little change for a new business condition, we had to go in and mess with that core row object, which meant that you were more likely to break something really, really, really important. What we eventually did was we made a checkout model, and now we have roles that you can compose in at runtime and say, well, I want to make a checkout, but I want, to not, I want it to be single page, and I want it to validate this or not validate that or have this data or not have this data. And that's been way more successful to us. And it also allows us to make changes without changing something so integral to the system that you take the whole site down. So that's been something. Yeah. We've been calling that a service layer. Is what yeah, we're absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of bigger organizations, when you're building these into your Java applications, yeah. will set aside an entire layer of that, uh, headed up by this 
architecture guy who writes interfaces, and that's all he ever does, and then he gives those interfaces to somebody else and says, you go implement this, code monkey. Um, you know, but you don't have to go that far off the deep end, but you can at least come back and write something that, that separates that business logic out a little bit so that your database and your business layer are separate, which is shocking because it seems like we've known that for 30 years, but we never get around to it. Um, transactions are awesome. Transactions mean you can just do crazy shit and just roll it back and you don't put anything in the database and then you get deadlocks. Um, MySQL has a fun little problem, or no, it's not a problem, it's, this is the way it's designed. InnoDB will lock, if you have a row that you're updating, it will lock the rows that it refers to with its foreign keys. And then you get these weird little deadlocks and stuff that are extremely difficult to trace. Um, it's like, a, you know, multi-core programming. This is really hard stuff. It twists your brain up. Um, this, this has caused us, uh, these days we don't really have the problems anymore, but I mean there have been at least three or four different instances where we've had some bit of code that interacted with some other bit of code, caused deadlocks in production, luckily never to any serious problems, but uh, definitely something that terrifies me in the night. Um, so use them only when necessary uh, and make them as simple as possible. You want the smallest amount of code. Don't start a transaction and then start allocating some things and checking if your fingernails are dirty and going over here and clearing a cache. Do all that shit ahead of time and then come back to it. Uh, if you're using DBIX class, use transaction do. Do not use begin and commit or open and close whatever it is because then you'll forget one and then your customer service application will have that problem for a year and a half and nobody will know about it and then there'll be a bunch of orders that suddenly have the wrong affiliate IDs and we gave the wrong people money. Um, that, uh, that happened. <laughs> uh, What's the name of that table? What's, What's that? the name of that temp table? Of that temp? Oh, that temp table? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So that that was my fault. What we end up doing is we actually have we actually still to this day have code in the end action that looks at the the at DBIC and goes, "Do you have any open transactions, maybe?" And then just shits the bed if that happens. Like, no, 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 call development right now. Here's the <laughs> uh, so design your schema appropriately. Uh, you want to minimize transactions. Now, everyone I think knows that NODB uses them implicitly, and you can't really get around it, but at the same time, use them as, as little as possible because they're both, they're, they're super awesome, powerful, but they will completely screw you. Um, I am thinking I'm a little behind, so I'm going to speed up a bit, but I highly recommend that when you are using an ORM, use something like DDX class query log, which I wrote, bias, um, but uh, profile that SQL log, everything you're doing, put it down at the bottom of the page, but the count, the time spent, and all that other stuff, because every time someone adds functionality to a page, you're adding more SQL. Something that we find people doing fairly common, especially new people, is uh, you know, when you've got DBX class, you have relations between tables. So if you've got a foo which has a bar, then people will do foo.bar to get bar. People will often do foo.bar.id instead of just doing foo.bar underscore ID. So that's a join and loading it up and inflating an object and making it and everything for absolutely no reason, because bar ID was already available on the other side. So that's something to watch for. Uh, again, watch your joins. Try to keep the, someone I think said something, there shouldn't be like more than three or five SQL statements per page. That's really great crazy guy, but in the real world, we have to do a lot more work than that. So we try to keep it as small as possible, uh, but uh, you know, reality means you do more. Um, stay on your developers. ORMs allow us to be very lazy ourselves included, keep an eye on every little thing you do because it all adds up. Um, these, these tasks are finite and take a certain amount of time. Um, and the faster things are, the more quicker people can give you money. Caching, um, caching things when it makes sense. We actually do very, very little caching at magazines.com. Part of that's because it's difficult to cache row objects. Um, but uh, simple data means simple caching, which is good. So instead of using big multi-megabyte huge objects using tiny little hash refs is nice because those serialize and go into uh, JSON really, really nice. You can stick them on disk or put them in memcache or something like that. <coughs> something that's important is just because something is cached does not make it fast. Sometimes the act of caching things and all the stuff that you do is actually slower. Sometimes the act of checking the cache, getting it back out again is slower than the operation that you were, uh, that you were trying to replace. So be sure and measure that. But write everything as if it will be cached. That's really important in a web application. The more data that you can stick away, the better. Our, um, we have widgets all over the website, the little boxes of something. Um, every one of those are written so that we can write them to disk. Right now, we, we're writing them all to disk on the individual boxes, which allows the caches to get in conflict with each other. But, uh, 
we're, we're switching over to Memcached D sometime this year uh, for everything. Um, also, log and analyze the success of your caching. Look at your cache hit ratio because you can put something in, you can speed it up, but you can find out that actually nobody ever does that. So it doesn't make sense to optimize the 2% of your code that never gets done. Instead, you cache the 98% that gets called all the time, which may not be as big a win. Um, Moose's lazy is really helpful for this. We use that a lot. So you can say this thing is lazy and that way you don't load it until later because then if you don't need it, you never bother to execute it, which is handy. Um, I highly, highly recommend you use a CDM. We actually took our website down because we didn't use a CDM. Um, funny little note that we actually use Mod Perl without any reversing or proxying or anything like that. So every static request that you send us, hits a, I saw an eyebrow or two go up, hits a big multi-megabyte Apache process that's giant and crazy. But uh, I've got a lot of money for hardware and can buy 18 servers, so I don't give a damn. Um, I didn't until it broke, and uh, then it's like, well, okay, Corey, we're going to double the amount of traffic that you get. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm going to double the amount of downtime you have. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so use a CDN. Uh, there are some easy, cheap ones. Amazon's got some, the, the, I forget what it's called, but they've got one uh, that you can pay as you go. We use Limelight, which is the only other real competitor to Akamai. I called Akamai and was like, hey, we do you know, so many gigabytes of traffic, and they're like, yeah, that's not enough, go away. So Akamai was where we went. Um, use the small, oh, minimizing piggyback code is important. Everybody usually puts Google Analytics on everything you do. In the e-commerce business, then there are 17,000 little assholes that want to put this stupid little tracking pixel on every page. Those eventually equate to the site not loading. <laughs> so you have to minimize that. And people, we, we had a problem, we used this, um, uh, it's one of the, it's a multivariate testing system where people would. How long is this yeah, talk so, supposed to be? Um, well, that guy's still working, so I guess. What time is this supposed to be over? Two minutes ago. Really? Yeah. Well, nobody came in. Huh? Yeah. So, I'm not taking you away. Well, I'm, I'm oh. Yeah, keep talking. Okay. Well, it's what is the time? Yeah. Huh? I could be done. It's only five minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm saying, okay. Five minutes over. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. One less words for us to have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or, or use the uh, the other one. Like, there's an optional one that asynchronously does something. There's another option. Um, the the lesson for me was people would come in and they'd say, "Corey, the site is slow. Is it Google Analytics, or is it this, or is it that?" It's never that, but they don't really get it. It's always the sum of the parts that makes the site slow. It's not that itself. Um, Blah, 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 blah. You still have to worry about I, IE6. People are like, oh, IE6 sucks. Like, shut up. A lot of people use it and they can't upgrade. It. Get over it. We're going to deal with it for a while. Uh, my rule, don't panic. I'm pretty good about this. I don't usually freak out. Um, but if you do, find someone to work with you who does not freak out when shit breaks. If you uh, use that person to help you patch and hotfix things. Um, but try not to make hot changes on production that don't go back. Yeah. And another thing is, um, things will break and will possibly break. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, your, your life's pretty much going to suck. Um, there's a certain amount of hubris that you have to contain to be able to do this job and not expect that your site's going to crash every five minutes. And that in the middle of the night, that $30 million a year in revenue that you're personally responsible for is not going to just melt down and cause you to get fired and make everybody lose their jobs. Um, what's that? On a holiday. Yeah, on a holiday. That happens. Um, so these are a lot of the things we use. Continuous integration. You should know what they If you don't know what any of this shit is, I'm out of time anyway, so you're just going to have to go look it up. Um, <laughs> The uh, Pearl Brew is badass. Please use it because it makes it a lot easier to not have to. I don't know how in the hell people with big Pearl installs manage it. We use NFS root for all our web servers, so they're all the same. But damn, if I can keep Pearl version synchronized, the tools for that suck ass and make me hate Pearl. I'd love to have something as easy as a jar. But anyway, giant pain in the ass and I hate it. We do code reviews. Um, I highly recommend you do real scheduling. Don't just patch things when they're ready unless you use some agile Kanban style and are trained to do that kind of stuff. Project managers are nice to have. If nothing else, they get in the way of uh, other people trying to get you to do shit, and then it's their job to figure it out. I'm looking at you back there. Um, keep a log of all the shit that you do, because when it breaks a few days from now, and they're like, hey, when did we patch the thing that broke the website? You can actually remember. Um, write a ticket for every damn thing you do. It may seem like a lot of work, but the act of writing it out helps you delegate it to other people and also means that you can refer to it in commits. Um, branch for everything. We keep a branch for every individual ticket and then we merge it back. Uh, tag it because being able to go back and say, what was the site like three days ago? You can actually do that. Uh, release managers, we don't have one. I really, really wish we did. Um, I could get them to give me the money to hire one. But it'd be really nice to have someone who actually thinks through all the problems of getting a release cooked and putting it out because we don't usually have time to do it very well, I can tell you that. 
uh, random DB stuff. Uh, even when you're running commits on your local instance and you're just trying to set this one tiny little change, use begin and commit because then someone will accidentally say, update addresses, set address 2 equal apartment 23B and leave off a where clause in the middle of the fucking day and change everybody's address in the entire system to be apartment 23B and then you have to restore it from back. <coughs> so by the way, back things up and also test that your backups work, that you can pull that out. Uh, what's that? Yeah, if I won't got it. Uh, that's happened. <laughs> Great. Delivered by truck, full of magazines. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> you test your backups. Uh, and in summary, so uh, do just enough, though, process-wise, to stay ahead of your own failures. Because if you, if you just go and you say, we're going to do all of this overhead and red tape and bureaucracy, people are going to hate you. They're not going to want to work for you. But do the smallest amount of work you can, but know that that means you're going to trip and fall occasionally. Uh, tomorrow, hopefully, you will need to upgrade your processes and add that new layer. We use JIRA, we have code tools, we have all kinds of fancy stuff um, because we keep breaking things. Uh, and again, using no methodology, so I'm too good for that shit. That is not good and it's not to be commended. You're not cool, uh, you're just lazy. Um, and above all, have fun with it. Any questions?